All right, so we uh, talked last time about goals, so we're going to finish talking about strategy. And we, I suggest to you that you want to think about these things in terms of not just what you have to know from the textbook, but how you're going to apply this in your own life. How are you going to use strategy to sort of achieve the goals that you want in your career, your academic success here and then in your career. So goals are going to be dependent upon you as an individual. We have a lot of variants. That's one of the things that makes marketing really, really interesting is that there's a whole lot of variation. If everybody wanted to do the same thing, marketing wouldn't be very interesting at all because we wouldn't have to figure out. When we talk about marketing research, we'll talk about the idea of variance and standard deviation. Uh, establishing what it is that makes a successful corporation or a successful product. How do we determine that we're going to be successful? So there's a lot of variants out there. In terms of organizations, in terms of yourself, the variance is going to be not everybody wants to be a marketer. As much as I think that you ought to consider marketing and sales in particular as your major, and some of you want to be accountants and you'll go through intermediate accounting, and then there will be tears and inside. Maybe you want to be done a marketer after you do that. But maybe you won't. Maybe you'll be just radically successful and intermediate and it'll all make sense to you. And then maybe you'll get to cost accounting and that's nothing really like accounting. And you'll decide there will be more tears and a few more of you will come see me about becoming a sales or marketing major after you go through cost. But, so, you know, it's going to depend on the individual. In organizations, it's going to depend on what type of organization we are. So there are three types of organizations that use marketing. There are for-profit, non-profit, and governmental. Your text talks about it as for-profit and non-profit, and then they don't mention the governmental. This is an important part. Marketing to the government is enormously lucrative if you can get into it. My sister is a vice president for Boeing before she became the vice president for Boeing. She was the president of L3 Integrated Systems. And what L3 Integrated Systems did was it modified the C-130 aircraft for the government. They made billions and billions of dollars. And she became very rich off of that project. So marketing to the government is important. The government also markets. They need things like people to join the military. And they engage in marketing campaigns. They rely on uh, constituents to support them. And ultimately, if you don't have enough support, uh, the government itself might fail. So the type of organization, are we for profit? Is that what we're about? Non for profit? Non for profits will use goals uh, to achieve objectives other than making money. What can be the objectives? Well, social marketing is, uh, and societal marketing is important. Achieving certain types of um, societal benefits that involve things like the public good, and nonprofits do that. <clears throat> With regard to for-profits, there are a number of types, and this is not trivial. What's the easiest type of business to start? Well, it's a sole proprietorship. And the goals of the sole proprietorship are generally to make a profit for yourself and maybe feed your family. It's the easiest one to form. You don't have to tell anybody, what could I do? and be a sole proprietorship and form, you know, without telling anybody, you don't have to go down and file any papers with the Secretary of State. Well, I can hang out a lot of uh, shingle to practice law. Now, when we talk about organizations of these types, don't confuse the ease with establishing with the substantive law that may govern a particular area. And we're going to talk about environmental scanning today, and so that will be an important consideration. So I can go out and decide I don't want to teach school here anymore. I want to go back to the private practice of law. I can hang out a shingle in my hometown in Guthrie that says Granny Geary, attorney at law. And uh, I don't have to, to file papers with the state to do that. You do have to, if you want to be a licensed attorney, though, you have to do what? Well, you have to have gone through law school. That's the substantive law. So there may be substantive law when we talk about environmental scanning. That would be important. Another type of for-profit is a partnership. It's like a DBA, except you have more than one person. You put together your energies, hopefully there's some synergy between uh, the partners and they start a business and you know one, prop, one prop partner is really good at sales and marketing, the other one may be good at finance and stuff like that. And then finally, the corporation. And the reason that I give you these three, three types is because the text talks a lot about the corporate form and strategies with regard to the corporate form. 
and looking at the various levels. So there are structural dimensions. The corporation and what we're going to focus on in terms of strategy at this corporate level is what? If you are the CEO of L3, so L3 is an umbrella organization for things like L3 integrated systems, L3 communication, L3 uh, product development. There are these various strategic business units underneath the corporate umbrella. And then within the strategic business units, there are functional departments. So at the corporate level, what kinds of things are you going to be focused on in terms of strategy? Broad or narrow? Narrow. Very, very broad. Setting broad directions for the company. Focusing on things like what? What is it that publicly traded companies at the, at the top brass focus on? Profit, because you have to report through the SEC, through your 10Ks and 10Qs, uh, things like that, and that affects what? Stock price. It affects your ability to sell your stock. There are two ways that you can capitalize a business. What are those two ways? You should have had this in finance. What? Equity or debt. And so your profit at that corporate level, they're going to look and make sure that you're you know, achieving broad goals like not, not causing the stock price to tank, to tank. At the strategic business units, strategic business units are organizations within the broader corporation that basically function somewhat autonomously. They have their own, for example, customers and clients. So L3 Integrated System sold aircraft, the C-130. Who is their biggest client? Well, it's the United States Air Force. That's who their client is and their constituency group. And then within that strategic business unit, so at the strategic business unit, you're going to set things like sales goals for the year or sales goals for the quarter. And then at the functional unit, so we're talking about sales and marketing, accounting, administration, you're going to set even more narrow goals, day-to-day -day operations. How do we get things out in, in time? So uh, depending on what level you're at, depends on kind of what kind of planning you're going to do for success and strategy. Long-term success, that's what we really want. And we should think about this again from the individual level. Jim Collins and Jerry Parias uh, wrote a book called Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. They studied 18 companies that were considered to be visionary. On average, they had been established, these companies, for over 100 years. They had been highly successful. They outperformed their competitors and the market in most cases. And the one thing that they found by looking at these, because there's a wide variety of companies, all the way from Johnson & Johnson to Philip Morris. Johnson & Johnson makes what? They make what? Not just baby products. They make pharmaceuticals. And they make, of course, baby products as well. But pharmaceuticals is their big one. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum was Philip Morris. What does Philip Morris manufacture? What? Cigarettes. They make cigarettes. So you've got these you know, sort of societally good benefits, and then you've got this company that's been very successful called Philip Morris that, that sells cigarettes. What they found is that the key thing among all of these companies was that they had a core set of values. Now think about this. What's going to make you successful as an individual? It's also having a core set of values. The trick was that you just had to have one. They didn't say those values had to be good. Are all values good values? What would be a bad value? You might look at somebody and say, that person is Machiavellian. Do any of you know what that means when I say somebody's Machiavellian? Uh, I know what you mean. I'm trying to think of another word other than Machiavellian. There's a thinker. If I asked you when Modernity, for example, begins. When does the modern era begin? Modernity begins in the Quattrocento, in the 15th century, the 1400s, and it begins with a thinker named Niccolo Bernardo de Machiavelli. And he writes a very famous treatise called The Prince. And in it, he describes the way that power is actually used. Rather than focusing on the ought or the normative, 
he focuses on the is, what is actually occurring. And so if you say that somebody is Machiavellian, and I think Machiavelli gets a bad rap, by the way, you're saying they're less than ethical. They're willing to do whatever it takes to get their goals. How many of you have met people like this, that they'll run over you if they need to, to get where they want? They view things in terms of a zero-sum game. You can have that kind of value. You know something like that? Yourself. You'll run out of here. Don't stand next to you if you want something. Okay. Good to know. I'll, I'll remember that. I have a concealed carry permit, by the way. <laughs> Just in case you get a little too aggressive. So they looked at Philip Morris, for example, and they were the epitome of a Machiavellian company. The CEO of Philip Morris was quoted, he was described as being ruthless, <coughs> cold-blooded calculating and manipulative. They said that he quoted, he was quoted as saying, I see nothing wrong with selling a product that people don't need. I see absolutely nothing immoral with selling a product that is purely a luxury. Well, I would say that selling cigarettes is more than just a luxury or a product that people don't need. It, it's actually a product that not only do you not need it, you don't need bubble gum. But the, you know, the health effects of bubble gum, particularly with sugar fruit, not all that great. They're pretty de minimis. It's got a lot of sugar and you chew it a lot, maybe you get some cavities. But um, cigarettes are definitely detrimental to your health. Contrast that with Johnson & Johnson. Now we'll talk about ethics in a minute, because you think about strategy. This is not without controversy. So you've got Philip Morris, who's totally focused. And at the other end, you have Johnson & Johnson, which was another company that had an enduring set of values. You probably can't see that, so I won't read it to you. Probably nothing worse than being read to, but I'll read it to you because I think it's worth thinking about. We believe that our first responsibility is to the doctors, nurses, and patients, to mothers and fathers, and all others who use our products and services. In meeting their needs, everything we do must be of high quality. We must constantly strive to reduce our costs in order to maintain reasonable prices. Customers' orders must be serviced promptly and accurately. Our suppliers and distributors must have an opportunity to make a fair profit. We're responsible to our employees, the men and women who work with us throughout the world. Everyone must be considered as an individual. We must respect their dignity and recognize their merit. They must have a sense of security in their jobs. Compensation must be fair and adequate, and working conditions clean, orderly, and safe. We must be mindful of the ways to help our employees fulfill their family responsibilities. Employees must feel free to make suggestions and complaints. There must be equal opportunity for employment, development, and advancement of those qualified. We must provide competent management, and their actions must be just and ethical. We are responsible to the community in which we live and work, to the world community as well, we must be good citizens, support good works, and charities bear our fair share of taxes. We must encourage civic improvement and better health and education. We must maintain in good order the property we are privileged to use, protecting the environment and the natural resources. Our final responsibility is to our stockholders. Businesses must make a sound profit. We must experiment with new ideas. Research must be carried on, innovative programs developed, and mistakes paid for. New equipment must be purchased, new facilities provided, and new products launched. Reserves must be created to provide for adverse times. When we operate according to these principles, the stockholders should realize a fair return. Now the reason that this, this is another, another visionary company, they've lasted a long time. The reason that this is controversial though, is that Milton Friedman would say that your first and only obligation is to your stockholders. To, ma to maximize utility and profit. But it's important that you have a core set of values. Companies that do that are more likely to succeed. Mission statements. What is it we do? Once you've got your core set of values, you've got to have a mission. What is it we do? Now look at page 30. They reference here a very famous work, one of the classics in marketing education called Marketing Myopia by Professor Theodore Levitt. And Professor Levitt says that what happens in many times is we become myopic in our outlook. If 
you went back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you would find that a lot of the most successful companies in this country were actually railroad companies. The robber barons were built on the railroads because people needed to get across the continent quickly and move goods and things from California to New York, for example. And so those were huge companies. A lot of them went broke. Why do you think they went broke? What is myopia? What does it mean when we say that you're myopic? How many of you are myopic? What is myopia? It's a physical condition. A lot of times what we do in marketing is we borrow from other disciplines. And so we borrow this term from the medical field. What, who, what is a person who is incredibly myopic? How many of you have seen a movie, a dystopian, a dark utopian called Gattaca with Ethan Hawke and things like that? How do they tell whether or not you are a genetically engineered person versus one that is not? The easiest way to determine was if they had myopia, because they had genetically modified individuals so that they weren't myopic, which means that they weren't nearsighted. How many of you have to wear glasses because you're nearsighted? Most people do. Well, Professor Levitt says companies become the same way. They become myopic. They become very nearsighted. And so railroad companies, for example, defined their mission as being what? A railroad company. But what's wrong with that? If you're just focused on what happened that came along that, that radically changed the way we transport goods. And what else? Planes. Planes. What happens in February? What's the holiday that happens in February in the United States and uh, other places that is one of my least favorite holidays? Halloween is my favorite holiday. My least favorite is probably Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. How many of you like Valentine's Day? Two of you like Valentine's Three of you like Valentine's Come on. The rest of you can, can admit mostly it, it seems that you know men hate Valentine's Day and women sort of like it. What are you supposed to give people on Valentine's Day? A hard time. A hard time. Other than a hard time. What are you supposed to give your fiancé? That's Oklahoma for fiancé. Roses. Do we grow a lot of roses in Oklahoma in February? No. no. Where do they come from? They don't. They come from the vast majority of red roses that will be sold on Valentine's Day come from South America. Now, how do we get them to Oklahoma in enough time? They, they harvest them in South America. They put them on planes. That's why that, that dozen roses costs you you know, what is a dozen roses for Valentine's Day? Valentine's Day. Yeah, they're, they're close to 100 bucks now. Why do they cost that? Well, transportation costs in terms of shipping. So we don't, we're not going to ship it by rail. Why? If we shipped it by rail from South America, what would happen to the roses? They would be dead before <laughs> we got them here for Valentine's Day. So Levin says these railroad companies and the ones that went broke, didn't focus, they were too myopic. They were very good at being railroad companies, but they didn't think about the thing that is the broader industry with, within which they operate, which is transportation. And there's lots of different ways that we transport stuff. And so uh, they, a lot of them went broke because they were too myopic in their vision. We produce and transport most stuff, by the way. 90% of everything is transported by water now. And there's a classic example of a, of a marketing study done by Rose George in a book called 90% of Everything, where she gets on a container ship and follows it from Liverpool all the way through uh, the Persian Gulf and through pirate waters and sees where it goes and, and how they operate. 90% of all the stuff that you use every day. Now, Apple actually doesn't ship their products by water, but most of the phones that come over from China are shipped on container ships, and what do you think it costs to ship a phone about this size on a container ship? What would you guess? Three cents. It costs three cents to ship something that's this big on a container ship. That's how efficient it is. So the transportation industry is a lot broader than just 
focusing on railroads. So growth strategies, diversification <coughs> analysis. Now, for those of you who have had your finance class, how many of you have finance? How many of you have had personal finance? Okay. What do we say in finance is the closest thing to a free lunch that you will get? You're a finance club officer. This should come Insurance. tripping off your tongue. Insurance, not finance. Insurance, not finance. Okay. The closest thing to finance that you get to a free lunch, economists will tell you there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Finance people will tell you there's something that's close. Diversification of your portfolio is a priori a good thing because it minimizes risk. 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 What type of risk? Does it minimize macroeconomic risk? No. It doesn't. It minimizes what? Microeconomic risk. It, it does not minimize macro risk. So if the entire stock market tanks, you may still not have uh, a good uh, performance of your portfolio. But at least if you're diversified, if, for example, in Oklahoma you became enamored with Chesapeake, about 10 years ago you were probably doing really, really well and what are you doing today? Not well, because you didn't diversify your portfolio. So you should diversify your portfolio because it minimizes microeconomic risk. Now, with regard to businesses, diversification is less clearly a good thing. And the reason is that with regard to your portfolio, you are not having to actively manage those assets. The companies manage it and you managing your portfolio are minimizing risk by diversifying your portfolio. Now, I don't know that there's a clear answer as to how much diversification you need, but you should diversify your portfolio. With regard to businesses, diversification may not lead to good results. And Hewlett Packard under Carly Pionaria was one example of when you start engaging in mergers and acquisitions that don't necessarily fit well with your company, it can be problematic if you don't understand the market into which you're going. Which is one of the reasons why good old Carly, when she said, hire me, I'm a business executive, you should make me president, yet you were a miserable business executive. Right? You were absolutely like, that you should be fired just for saying that, because you were absolutely miserable at this. But the Boston Consulting Group has come up with a way of analyzing your product lines. And it's dependent upon whether or not you have a high market share versus a low market share and whether or not there is potential for market growth or not. And so products fall within a two by two matrix or four quadrants. And where you really want to be is you want to have stars. Now, the thing about it is, is that eventually stars change. Apple is about to come out with a new iPhone, which will be the iPhone 7, right? And so will the iPhone 6 still be a star? No, it may be a cash cap where you harvest it, you get, you get the money from it, you build, uh, or you, uh, you diversify your line and, and create new products. Where you don't want to be is low market share and low growth. Those are dogs, and generally speaking, you want to divest yourself. You want to harvest those resources and divest yourself of those products, unless, of course, there's some reason, like a strategic alliance that you need to maintain those products. So there was a company that manufactures, for example, paper tubes, things that you use, that you get on your paper towel rolls. Well, there was a company in New England, the New England Paper Roll Company, New England Paper Roll Company, that was manufacturing these things and they were going broke. And one of their managers actually put together, in his spare time he realized this company's going into receivership, and he went to the receivers, he was a manager who was kind of mid-level, and he realized that there were products that they were manufacturing that it was costing them to manufacture, and they just continued to manufacture them because they had done it forever and ever and ever. And he said, what we need to do is we need to reduce and focus on those things that we do really well. And it turns out they manufactured about six products really, really well that were also really, really profitable, and shed those ones that were dogs that were not profitable. So you analyze your, your market based on these criteria, whether or not you have high growth uh, and whether or not you have a relatively high market share. The most difficult one of these cash cows, you usually take your money and you put it towards the question marks. 
These are the most difficult to, to determine whether or not you should invest or whether or not you should go a different way. The question marks are the most difficult, but cash cows can be used to uh, fund things like stars or question marks and new products. So that's one of the things that we can look at in terms of our strategies for growth. In doing this, we talk about, and I had you start the semester by doing part of the SWOT analysis, by coming up with your strengths that make you unique. But it includes a number of things. Two are internal strengths and weaknesses, and every company has them. You want to focus on your strengths, those things that give you a competitive advantage, minimizing your weaknesses, and then there are two that are external, opportunities and threats that you have to look at in your analysis of uh, of the environment, which brings us to environmental scanning. So I often think that other than the fact that historians don't make nearly as much money as marketing professors, I would kind of like to be a historian sometime. That's what I actually started out as, was a historian and political scientist. And then I realized how little money they made, and I switched to being a marketing professor because we get paid better. And one of the things that I like about history is that it doesn't change. We know who won the Civil War. You might go out and you might find some obscure you know, battle to study and write some paper about it, but we know how that one ended. Uh, it's amazing to me how many movies we go and see that we know the ending. How many of you saw Titanic? How many of you liked Titanic? The movie with the scale. You liked it? You, you knew how this was going to end poorly, right? It was going to end poorly. Well, we know how that's going to end. In marketing, we don't know that. And so we have to engage in environmental scanning so that we can continue to grow and be successful. Marketing is, of course, extraordinarily dynamic. And there are generally five factors that influence the marketing environment and what we have to deal with. Sources of change. Social, economic, technological, competitive, and regulatory. Social. We look at things like demographics. Now demographics are really useful because again, one of the things that we do as we've gone from the production era, if you build it, they will come, to this era of value co-creation and relationship marketing, is we have to be able to segment the market. We'll talk about that uh, a lot more when we get to start segmenting, targeting, and positioning um, in the chapter. But one of the things that we have to look at is, is demographic trends. So what's going on with regard to the population in the world as a whole? And most companies now, by the way, have some international aspect to them. It used to be that you could go to work for a company and maybe you went to work and they had a wholly uh, US based customer or all of their products that they bought to serve their customer were largely US based. Is there any such thing as a truly just US company anymore? or most companies international. Even small companies like Petra Industries, which is located here in Edmond, it's a multi-million dollar electronics distributor, is an international company because most of their supplies come from where? Where did this phone get built? It got built in China. Where did most of the cables that we buy for our projectors, our computers, our speakers, where do those come from? China. Where do most of your clothes come from? Walmart? Where does Walmart get most of its clothing? Sweatshops. Sweatshops in China. Or where else? Taiwan, India, South America, Mexico. And so what's happening with regard to the world population? The world population is growing. We live on a planet that can comfortably support about 3 billion. We've got 7 and we're headed towards 9. That's a little frightening, isn't it? 
to think about. But what's happening to the U.S. population? It's actually growing, but not as quickly as some of the developing countries. It's aging. The biggest boom of babies occurred after World War II. That's your parents' and your grandparents' generation for some of you. And they're getting older, so what's happening in the U.S. environment? Well, the U.S. population is actually getting older. We had the largest high school graduating class something like five years ago. That's not necessarily good for higher education. So as I think about, for example, what we produce here, one of the things that I've said in committee meetings that I go to is we need to think about this environmental scan. The largest high school graduating class occurred five years ago. We had our largest graduating class last year here at UCO. What does that mean in terms of the student population that we're going to be serving at the University of Central Oklahoma. The traditional population, at least, is going to be declining for the foreseeable future. Why is that? Why is it declining, or why is it getting older? Why is the population getting older? How many of you want to have seven kids? None. How many of you want to have one kid? Lots of people are choosing, lots of couples are choosing to have what? One kid. If you only have one kid, if you have two kids, you're doing what? If everybody has two, you're just maintaining homeostasis in the population. Because you're replacing yourselves. you got to have more than two kids. You need 2.1, so you keep growing a little bit. A little bit, right. You need, you need, you need at least, you know, statistically, you need to have, no, nobody can have 0.1. But the average family, the average family unit is decreasing in size. In the United States. What does that mean? Well, what does it mean for marketing? Well, it means that we're going to see a lot more products and services being offered in areas and industries like what? Healthcare. Why? Because as you get older, you have what? More health issues. So that's going to be a growing field. So the U.S. population is getting older. What else is happening to the U.S. population? It's becoming more diverse. They said that if Mitt Romney had been elected when he ran against Barack Obama for his second term, it would be the last time the Republican Party could really rely on white, middle-class America. That was the last election. And we're going to find out whether or not, now maybe Donald Trump can resurrect it, but probably not. We're going to find out whether or not that's going to be a sustainable model. For the party, it's not, ultimately, because Texas becomes minority-majority in 2018. There's a catchy little bureaucratic phrase. They become minority-majority, which means that the minorities will actually outnumber what has historically been the majority. This is the first time in history that we have four generations in the workforce. What does this mean for you as you enter the workforce? So there are traditionalists. When I went into the private sector and I was an executive vice president, the chief executive officer of the company that I worked for was a traditionalist. He was constantly complaining because our sales force weren't ever in the office. Well, when he was going through business school 50 years ago, you had to go to your office to be productive because there was this thing that was connected to the wall that you relied upon to get business. It was called a telephone. We no longer need to be in the office because we've got what? Phone. The phone is no longer attached to the wall. It's now attached what? To our hand. And so if your sales force, and our, if our VPs were actually in the office, he would, he would come down to my office and say, that Damn, Kevin Larry never's in the office. And I'm like, if he's in the office, you don't really, he, he shouldn't be in the office. If he's in the office, he's not selling. You've got to be out there to be selling. But he was a traditionalist. He, he viewed, you know, like, work was something that you did. You went there, you went to an office. That's not the way we do it anymore. But you have these attitudes that you'll have to deal with. And companies have to recognize also how to deal with this. So, like, I had to explain to Jeff multiple times, our sales force should never be in the office. If the sales force is in the office, there's a problem. They're not selling. Then you have boomers. These are the children of the traditionalists. For most of you, the boomers are your parents or your grandparents. They have a tendency to have some of the same characteristics as the traditionalists. 
they have a tendency to believe in hard work and you know nine to five and things like that. And then we have my generation, which are the Xers, which were the first generation to say what? We were the first to be defined as the me generation. And what do Xers think about work? For traditionalists, it's very much you live to work. Boomers started to get away from that. Xers definitely started to say why. I, I work to live. And I don't want to necessarily work hard. It's one of the reasons I became a college professor. <laughs> this is the closest, I'm very lazy. This is the closest thing I can do to getting paid six figures and not having to work real hard two days a week. So, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to live to work. I work to live. And then we have millennials, which is also called Generation Y. That's your cohort. What do we know about millennials? They are like Gen Xers on steroids. You absolutely don't want to live to work. What does that mean for the workforce? Well, you're going to value a lot more things like what? Time off. Work is going to be more contingent for your generation. You're going to probably have more than one career. You're going to work for more than one company. When my grandmother went to work way back in the 1950s, she went to work for one corporation and she stayed there her entire life. That's not the way it's going to be. Most of you will go to work for multiple corporations over your uh, career. And so we have to look at these social things. Culture. Culture is enormously important in thinking about marketing. There are various and vastly different cultural things that we have to be aware of out there. Are we even different culturally? We have a national culture. So there are certain things, for example, products that we can sell. We all have a tendency to buy things like American flag apparel and stuff like that because we have this national culture, but we also have local cultures that influence buying. Are we different in Oklahoma than, say, New York? Are the products that we buy different than in New York? How so? We buy a lot more trucks here. We buy a lot more trucks here. You live in New York City, you're not buying a truck. I drive a Dodge Ram 3500 because I have a very large boat. My boat weighs 28,000 pounds, and I have to be able to pull it. You have to have a big truck to pull that. They don't have a lot of big trucks in New York City. I drove my truck through New York City. It's a, it's a harrowing experience because the streets are narrow, and people are honking at me because it's got these large hips. It's a dually. That's, that's a stereotypical Oklahoma. You see a lot of duallys in Oklahoma, you don't see a lot of duallys in New York. The colors that you all wear, are, we are, are, the colors that we wear are much brighter. They wear a whole lot of blacks and grays. I think it's to go along with the weather that's sports in the wintertime. We're, we're far more vibrant. What else is different here in Oklahoma? When I got my PhD, I went to New Mexico State University to get my PhD. They asked children in the fifth grade where they were most likely to see a boat. Do you know what the number one answer was for fifth graders in New Mexico where they were most likely to see a boat? On the highway. That's where they said they'd see a boat. Why is that? New Mexico is a desert. And there's not a lot of lakes. If you ask Oklahoma kids where are they most likely to see a boat, what will they say? At the lake. They'll say at the lake because we have a lot of we have a lot of lakes and we have a lot of boats. Um, kids in New Mexico saw boats going down the road for the most part. They didn't see them on the lakes. As a result, one of the things that we sell a lot of in this state is we sell a lot of wave runners, sea dews, things like that. They don't sell a lot of those in New Mexico. What do they sell? They sell quads. If you go to if you go to the Honda dealer in Las Cruces, New Mexico, they won't sell any personal watercraft. They may have one, because there's a lake that's a little bit north of Las Cruces called Elephant View, which is kind of this big mud hole in the desert. It's not very pretty. But they sell a lot of quads, a lot of side-by-sides, racers. They sell a whole lot more of that than we do in Oklahoma, because they've got a lot more space for it, a lot more government land where you can go and you can go out on trails and do that. The whole damn state looks like Little Sahara. If you go to New Mexico, all of Las Cruces, it's the ugliest place on the planet. It looks like the moonscape. They sell a whole lot of that. So there's different cultures, and that can be an influence on the things that we sell that we have to think about. Economic. 
macro level factors, GDP, gross domestic product, whether or not it's going up. They're going to talk about the release of the jobs. The jobs figures were just released, and that has obviously an impact on whether or not we can expect consumer spending to stay high. Turns out that the job numbers are weak, and yet consumer spending has stayed fairly high. Why is that? It's largely psychologically driven, and people think that the economy is going to get better. And when people think that the economy is going to get better, they go out and do what? They spend money, and they make the economy grow. So we look at things like income, and we can drill down through these things when we talk about marketing research. We look at gross income, which is the total amount of income that you make for your household or an individual. Then disposable, disposable income is the money that you have left over after taxes and necessities. And then we have discretionary for things like luxury items, vacations. We can look at these factors when we talk about marketing research, we'll look a lot at how we determine these things and whether or not you can sustain the kind of businesses that you want. I'm from Guthrie. Guthrie doesn't have an Outback Steakhouse. Why is that? Edmond has an Outback Steakhouse. Why do they have an Outback Steakhouse? The average income in Guthrie is, or the average income in Edmond is a lot higher. They've got a lot bigger population. They can sustain it. You're not going to put an Outback in, in Guthrie. It's not going to survive because we don't have the income. We don't have the population base. They don't have the discretionary income for the most part that Edmondites have. So we think uh, about things like that. So we have to look at that micro and macroeconomic factors and doing our environmental scan. Technology. What are some of the things that are coming up in the world of technology? Well, social networks, mobile marketing, social marketing. I will show you the power of Facebook and why Facebook is a multi-billion dollar company. Because you can get a lot of information. Big data mining is available through Facebook. You give up all kinds of information to Facebook and so these social networks are one of the things that is uh, increasing. And that's a technological advance. The world has become much smaller. You can connect with people all over the world through this device. It's making things a lot easier. It's making the world smaller, these social networks. Um, graphical user interfaces are not just graphical user interfaces anymore. What can you do with your phone? It's not just the user interface. It's also now what? It's not just graphics. It's what? Touch screen voice recognition. Yeah. How many of you use the thumbprint or fingerprint to unlock your phone? Is it any good? It doesn't recognize mine about half the time because I've got sweaty hands. And so about half the time my hands are, aren't dry, it doesn't recognize it. Apparently the iPhone 7 is getting better. So technology. Another one that's becoming increasingly and is sort of Orwellian, and when we think about ethics that we'll talk about on Thursday, we ought to think about this, this use of biotechnology and what we can do with that. They're now using biotechnology, biometrics, to analyze whether or not you will be a good stockbroker. Whether or not you can deal with stress. These companies are now, isn't that a little creepy? Think about, they're now going to give you stress tests and see if you have high percentages of cortico or testosterone and how you perform under stressful conditions. We can use that. So that's a technological change that's, that's influencing how we market it and the kinds of people that we hire. The competitive market. <coughs> Whether we have pure competition, in which we have many sellers. If you go around Edmonds, there are lots of places you can buy gas. They're not just 7-Eleven. You've also got what? Quick Stop, On Q, Sam's, which is Murphy, Oil, where else? Shell. Shell, BP. So you've got pure competition. Why isn't gas prices in a community stay fairly consistent among suppliers because everybody knows you can get online on gasbuddy.com and figure out where the lowest prices are and that's where you're going to go it's amazing to me how many of you will drive five miles out of your way to save three cents on a gallon of gas <laughs> but you'll do it stillwater at one point in time when my brother was going to school there he was on the tennis team at osu i went to ou 
two guys on all of the gas stations in Stillwater. And the gas prices in Stillwater, miraculously, because there were two guys that owned all of the gas stations in Stillwater, were what, would you guess? They were higher than the rest of the state because there was an oligopoly. There were two sellers, they got together and had breakfast, and it was amazing how the prices of gas changed. Now, that's illegal, actually. Price fixing is illegal, but trying to prove it is very difficult. If you have a monopolistic competition, you have many sellers compete with substitutable products. What are substitutable products? Well, beverages. There's lots of different beverages that you can buy. There's Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi. There are water. I think Coke is one of those things that's dying out, soft drink products, because we recognize that they're not necessarily healthy for you. What's a substitute for that? Well, tea, coffee, things like that. And then you can have a pure monopoly. We generally, through the Sherman Antitrust, don't allow that, but we do in certain situations. So where do you have a pure monopoly? If you live in Edmond, how many of you live in Edmond? Can you just decide I don't want to buy uh, electric from Edmond Electric? I'm going to go with og &E. No, they have a pure monopoly. You have to be on Edmond Electric. Can you decide I'm going to sink a well in my front yard because I don't like the water bills that I'm getting in Edmond? No, you can't. You can't do that. You have to be hooked up. They have a city ordinance that says you have to be hooked up to Edmond Water, and that's a pure monopoly. Um, what we do is, and this is another part of the environmental scan, with regard to those types of things where we allow pure monopolies and things like uh, utilities, cable, for example, is pretty much a pure monopoly, they're regulated. The utilities are regulated and they have to uh, maintain uh, their prices through the Corporation Commission. So then we have regulatory. Most companies are now becoming international and so you have to understand the regulatory environment of the countries in which you want to go into. There are a number of things that you should consider when you're going into another country in terms of their regulatory environment, what kind of government they have, how stable it is, things like the way contracts are handled, where you're going to have a choice of form, choice of law clause become important and international. And then within the United States, we have what's called dual sovereignty. And this is something that we have to think about from a business standpoint. And it's one of the aspects that's become a major issue in the campaigns this year. Because what is Donald Trump saying that we need to do in order to grow our economy? We need to have less regulation. Why? Because it costs money. In the United States, we have this idea of dual sovereignty, which means we have a national sovereign. And we usually diagram this in terms of spheres. So we have a national government, and we have state governments. And where they overlap, these are called concurrent powers. So what are some of the concurrent powers, for example? Both governments have the ability to tax. Now, from a business standpoint, this becomes important in thinking about where you're going to go. What is New York State doing in order to try and attract businesses? How many of you have watched the commercials that New York State has put out? What are they doing to try and get businesses to move to New York State from other places in the nation? Well, they're offering tax breaks to companies that will move in to New York State for up to five years. You, you may be tax-free in order to try and attract those businesses. What makes business attractive in Texas as opposed to Oklahoma? That'll, there's no state income tax in Texas. So a lot of people go to Texas. A lot of businesses relocate to Texas because there's no state corporate. They do have kind of a corporate tax, but it's not the extent to which we have in Oklahoma. What does that mean, though, for businesses? How do they tax? If they don't have a three-legged stool in terms of tax base at the, at the state and, and local level with regard to tax bases, we usually define it as a three-legged stool. The stool is income tax, what else? Property tax and sales tax. Texas sits on a two-legged stool. So what does that mean? You have higher property and sales taxes in Texas. And so it's one of the things that businesses have to think about. Yeah, you're not going to pay the corporate income tax, but you might pay what? You're going to pay a lot higher property taxes. The average tax price for a home in Dallas 
is something like $20,000 a year. That adds a lot to your mortgage in terms of, you know, because the mortgage companies do what? They generally pay your taxes and insurance to make sure that their asset is protected and then they pass those things on to you. For most of our history in the United States, we had what was called the layer cake model of federalism in which you had distinct layers between the federal and the state government and they didn't interfere with each other or mix a lot. And for the most part, under the layer cake model, the top layer or the national layer was relatively small. And the states were much more active. So we had the national government and the states. And the bigger layer in the, in the cake was the state layer. That was where you got most of the regulation. Three things occurred to lead to the rise of the administrative state. And they've had profound impacts on business. They were the Great Depression, the Civil Rights Movement, and technology. In the 1930s, the stock market crashes, the world goes into a, a depression, and problems that had heretofore been considered the province of the states were being placed at the footstep of government. And so the national government had to take over a lot of the problems that the states had been dealing with, and they become a much more active player in government. Then in the 1960s, we get the civil rights movement, and the national government begins to interfere in the realm of business even more than they had before, and then finally technology. It, it doesn't matter, it used to be that most things were regulated, things like food and restaurant safety were regulated at the local level. Well, food now moves across national boundaries, and so it's regulated by the USDA and the FDA a lot more than it ever had been in the past. There are a couple of cases that are seminal here that you should know for a test, because they're always test questions. Um, they're Heart of Atlanta Motel, and these are illustrative of how the national government has, through the civil rights movement, impacted business. Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States, 1964, and Katzenbach, K-A-T-Z-E-N-B-A-C-H, versus McClung. MCCLUNG, 1964. And these dealt with the Civil Rights Act. President Kennedy gets elected in 1960, and he's assassinated in Dallas. And a big portion of his legacy is left to President Johnson to fulfill. And Johnson feels a moral obligation to really take out the Kennedy mantle and pass the Civil Rights legislation. We get the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights legislation prohibited discrimination in, public, uh, in private accommodations as opposed to public accommodations. In 1954, we get a case called Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And in that case, the Supreme Court desegregates public accommodation. So, for example, swimming pools, schools, uh, public parks, things like that could no longer be segregated along the lines of uh, racial identification. But they still maintained Jim Crow throughout the American South by maintaining it in places like hotels and restaurants and things like that. And it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we get this change. Under Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, Congress is authorized to regulate interstate commerce, I-N-T-E-R, versus intra, I-N-T-R-A. Interstate commerce, versus intra, which is state commerce, which is wholly within the confines of one state. Johnson passes the civil rights legislation in 1964, and the Heart of Atlanta Motel sues. And they say, look, we are a hotel. We're not a chain. We're not a Hilton. 
We're wholly located within the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta, and we only engage in intra-state business. And the court, in upholding the Civil Rights Act of 1964, says, of course you're engaged in interstate commerce, because what? Yeah, people come from out of state and stay at your hotel. That makes you involved in interstate commerce. In Katzenbach versus McClung, Ollie's Barbecue was owned by the McClungs. It was off the beaten path. They did not allow African Americans into the dining room. They would allow them to have takeout or takeaway from the back door, not even the front door. And they said, we're, we're not engaged in tourist trade. We're a local business. We cater to local people only. We're not on an interstate. And the Supreme Court looks at it and says, oh, but you are involved in interstate commerce. You got your ketchup packets. Who manufactures ketchup? Which corporation? Heinz. Which, by the way, who was the heiress of the Heinz fortune? Teresa Heinz Carey. Her husband ran for president a few years ago. You might have heard of him. John Carey. Where is Heinz manufactured? The Northeast. Where did you get your silverware? It wasn't manufactured in Georgia. It came from other places. The end result is that we get a whole lot more regulation. There's almost nothing, if you look at Heart of Atlanta Motel and Katzenbach versus the Club, that the federal government can't regulate if they now choose to do this. And so we get this marble cake model where it's impossible to tell where one begins and the other ends. They're often intertwined intimately. So the federal government regulates health and safety of food, but local governments, if you want to start a business, for example, like a restaurant, can you just go out and start slaughtering your pigs in the backyard and selling it in your restaurant? No. Right? The USDA and the FDA are going to come in, and you're also going to have to, with regard to the health and safety of your restaurant, have what? You're going to have to have the local fire marshal come in and give you a occupancy permit, and they're also going to inspect things like what? The cleanliness of your restaurant, the way you store your food, whether or not you have uh, the appropriate type of freezers and refrigerators so that you don't give everybody listeriosis. So we've got this marble cake model, and it's one of the things that we have to think about in terms of regulation. How much regulation are we subject to, and what impact does that have on business? So, next time we will talk about, and I'm going to give you the rest of the class period to discuss this because your next critical thinking exercise, you have one that's due tonight at midnight to the drop box, which is the weighted average. I'm just waiting with bated breath for everybody to get that one in so I can see how many people actually got it right this semester. Um, every semester, a big portion of you don't get the, don't get the numbers right, which is just as fascinating to me. So I'm really interested to see if you all are smarter than my class last semester in terms of the weighted average. But you also have one that we'll do that we'll talk about in class and maybe the rest of the class to discuss it. I want you to answer these two questions. What is, since we're going to talk about ethics, what is justice? You need to define it and come up with at least, and I'm giving you 15 minutes in class to start, and I'll give you some time at the beginning of class next time. What is justice? Give me at least three examples. And how does it relate to marketing? All right. What is justice? How does it relate to marketing? Any questions? Any questions about strategy or environmental scanning? Again, if you have questions, you're always welcome to text me. Or call me on my cell phone if you think of questions. You can get to your groups and work on that question. I'll give you some time at the beginning of class as well, and I'll set up a drop box for this critical thing here.